In this installment of our high performance computing series, we have Dr. Carlos Lopez from the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. Dr. Lopez's work uses high performance computing to develop numerical methods to understand signal transduction cascades in cells and their dysregulation in cancer. Hello, Dr. Lopez. Thanks for taking the time to talk today. Hello, Luke. Thank you for inviting me. This is really uh, exciting. I'll just add uh, Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center and Vanderbilt University. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so what we do is basically um, uh, we try to understand the, the, the core we try to understand how networks network processes how things travel and, and communicate through a network and then how noise affects that network for an outcome so for example think about the game back in the when you were young that, that a broken telephone game we used to play this, tele, this game where you would tell someone a secret and then the person would tell the secret to another person and so on and so forth and by the end of the of the of the of the network of people, the, the message was already distorted. And so um, cells are very similar. Uh, they, they don't have a brain, but they make decisions or what looks like decisions. And uh, they have chemical reactions and one chemical reaction processes one thing. And then that passes that information to another chemical reaction and so on and so forth. And they make these networks of reactions that commit the cell to an input or to an output. So my lab uh, studies how information travels through networks and then how noise affects those networks. And, and, and even though there's noise in the environment in the world, the cells still make, you know, commit to, to different fates. So uh, that can be applied to many things. So we apply it right now to cancer work, to how a drug affects a cell and how the cell commits to, to, to death or bypasses death. But it could apply it also to a, to a virus. Uh, right now we have COVID. Uh, how, does a, how does a virus attack a cell and how does the cell respond to that attack? That's the kind of stuff that we work on. Fascinating. So, uh, yeah, so uh, where, where to start? So let me ask you this, uh, a little bit of background. How, how did you get where you are now? What's, what's your, your arc and your journey? What brought you to this type of research? That's a great question. So um, I started out being an artist, or I wanted to be an artist, and my parents wouldn't let me. So I said, uh, fine, I'll be a theoretical physicist, which is equal and applicable. I'll starve even more and, and make less money. And um, and then I started to take physics and chemistry, and, um, and um, the, the switch came when I took biochemistry. And uh, in biochemistry, I was very interested in how things at the molecular scale are in inanimate objects, atoms, molecules, they just kind of move around and do their own thing. And then at one point, something just kind of clicks and life happens. And I became very interested in how that works and how, how you go from proteins coming together and interacting together, and then something just kind of shifting over and then a system being alive. And, and you can show this even in experiments. You can take, um, you know, uh, a few proteins and put some ATP and shake it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a test tube. And then you get, you know, oscillations and you start to get circadian rhythm behaviors and things like that. And so my interest is really about how does, how does information get transferred across scales from atomic molecular interactions all the way to cell behavior, cell population, um, uh, humans, right, organisms. And uh, that's easier said than done because at the atomic level, you have nanometer, nanosecond, uh, femtometer, femtosecond interactions for, for bonds. And then at the human scale, you have, you know, hours, days, years, right? And the, the example I use in my class is that uh, I think a nanosecond is to a second, like a second is to about a century. So it would be the equivalent of saying, you know, how does this, in, how does this uh, conversation you and I are having, is, is that, how is that going to affect Earth in 100 years? That's kind of the equivalent kind of scale and space and time that we that we uh, have to explore to understand cellular responses, and that's where we need a lot of computer tech. Interesting. So, where the rubber hits the road, what is what does that look like? Like, what how how does that happen on computers? Uh, so, biology is uh, unlike physics and and, uh, and uh, engineering in that we're still discovering the rules. We're still discovering the behaviors. Um, we. Uh, we, we make experiments, we make observations, we, we measure a lot, of, uh, a lot of things and we end up with a lot of data. Uh, a lot of dynamic data, we measure things with mass spectrometry, fluorescence microscopy, you know, other techniques. And then in the end, we end up with a bunch of information and the question is how do we put it together? And um, what we have done is, or one of the key interests in my lab is how do you make models that explain that data? And um, because if we have a model and we have a mechanistic model, we can explain the behaviors and we can predict outcomes. And so what we're discovering is, first of all, even though we have a lot of data, there's not enough data. Uh, cells are so complex and there's so much information and so many things going on that we're still far from understanding these things. 
So what we do instead is we use um, statistical models or probabilistic models where we say, okay, what is the probability that this mechanism explains the data? And where are the gaps in this mechanism that is failing our data? So what we have been doing, for example, with IBM is uh, what I think is a very innovative um, uh, set of tools where we have decided that, well, data comes in four flavors. There's your quantitative data where you actually count the marbles or count the atoms. There's semi-quantitative data where you can measure things indirectly, but you still have an idea of how much there is. There's uh, ordinal data where you, where you just know that there's a little bit, a little bit more, a lot more, but you don't have actual numbers for that. And then there's nominal data, for example, yellow, red, alive, dead, uh, differentiated, undifferentiated. And so what we have done is we've developed a, a machine learning tool set that um, allows us to take non-quantitative data to calibrate quantitative models. And so it, it's kind of like, a, it's much more like climate modeling than like designing an airplane. We, we try to start understand cells from a kind of statistical mechanistic perspective. And the more data you give me, the better predictions I can give you. Does that make sense? I, I, it does. And I, I think I'm seeing the, the artist side of you come out here because <laughs> <laughs> scientists and engineers usually have maybe a stereotypical repu reputation of being very sort of, you know, everything is rigid and, and locked in, but there's, seems like there's some the wiggle room here. It, 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 can, it can get you in trouble and can, and with, with my wife when she says, well, are you going to take out the trash? And I was like, most likely. I'm a statistician by heart, you know. <laughs> so it can be either way. <laughs> Well, and when you were mentioning the, the scales of time, it reminded me, uh, I'm obsessed with uh, watching like PBS Space Time and watching a lot of videos about, you know, um, quantum theory and this, and it's that same notion where it's, it's like we have a certain, you know, we exist in the tennis ball world and it's, we have this sort of intuition about how the world works in a day, in a minute, but to, to shift our understanding to either very big or very small scales is, it's not intuitive, right? So we need exactly. tools to, to help us do so this. I think the scale and the number of players are the, are the things that, that make a big difference in understanding cellular processes. So for example, uh, we're working on a project with uh, Dr. Tina Iverson, uh, where she's studying uh, GPCRs, which are these receptors that, that, uh, that sit at the cell surface and they sense uh, perturbations. And there's something, there's on the order of hundreds of these receptors. And depending on how a signal comes, the receptors somehow work together to give the cell an input and the cell takes that input and knows what to do. And how do you understand how, you know, even 10, 10 molecules work together to give you a, a commitment to fate? That's the kind of thing where, you know, if you put 10 people in a room together, it's hard for them to come to a decision. Now imagine molecules, you know, kind of working together and, and, and using the language of chemical reactions. And that, it's kind of the same concept, but at, at the micro scale. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you, have, you have noise, you have a lot of, uh, you know, stochastic processes, things that just move around. Um, so what we do um, with, uh, in that case, what we do with, uh, with, especially with computers, is we actually try to make guesses. So we, we know, for example, that a chemical reaction uh, cannot be faster than how water diffuses. And we know that it cannot be slower than, I don't know, the lifetime of the cell. And within those, you know, six, eight orders of magnitude, it could be anything. And so we start to, we start to probe, probe values of those parameters until we find the optimal combinations that give you um, an understanding of how that process works. So uh, that, that's so where I have a question. Is. Yes, go ahead. So, Carlos, how does computational science and algorithms help you understand those relationships? That seems oh. very complicated. Well, it, 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 so what helps us the most is, so we're, we set up this interface between the kind of computer scientists, applied mathematicians, and the biologists, right? We're, we're kind of the, the, this conduit where inform biological information comes, we turn it into math, computer stuff, then we do the computer stuff and we turn it back into biological information. Um, what helps us is, for example, things like, uh, like you know, let's talk about the Power9 machine that, that, we, that we use in-house to, to develop some of the work we do. Uh, to, to sample all these big parameter spaces takes a lot of time. And so we have used, we have now uh, leveraged GPU, CPU hybrid architectures to sample that space very quickly and very aggressively. And we can do, for example, um, I was just talking with my student yesterday, we can do it in the order of, uh, you know, 15 to 100 million simulations over the course of a day or a few days, whereas we could not have done that, you know, a year ago. A year ago, we, we're 100 times faster now in anything that we can do. And that is where we are getting to knowledge quicker. So 
what we're doing is taking data and getting knowledge out of the data so we can actually inform biologists and guide them. And that's where the computation helps us. Uh, faster computers, um, more, more uh, uh, being able to handle com more complex systems, bigger networks, that's the kind of thing that, that really helps us uh, in terms of understanding uh, how cells work. Fabulous. It's really about understanding life processes. Does that answer your well, question? Yep. Uh, and I'm imagining that, like, the, the, as you're mentioning, the, you know, even just simulating a few molecules is, is uh, very complicated. So I'm imagining these, there's some cliche saying I can't remember, right, about models never being true but being useful. How good are models? So um, models are as good as the data you have. And that is, that is one of the biggest challenges. So um, we, can, we can put constraints. So we use, we use a technique called Bayesian statistics or, or conditional probabilities to say, you know, under this constraints, what is the probability that I can understand this system? Um, uh, just to give you an example, if, if I, so, 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 you know, there's two types of statistics, I guess, or two major schools of statistics, uh, frequentist statistics and uh, Bayesian statistics. So the frequentist, this is what we learn in, in high school and college, um, where you, for example, if you wanted to look at the probability that an airplane will take off the airport, you just go every day and you count how many airplanes take off over time, you, you count that number divided by time, and you say, okay, there's a probability that my plane will take off in the next hour, right? In, in conditional probability or in Bayesian statistics, we, you say, okay, well, you know, the weather today, it's sunny, it's really good weather, uh, but it's hot, so, you know, you can start to put more constraints into your system. And, uh, and then you can come up with a better uh, guess of when a plane will take off if it's sunny versus when it's uh, raining versus you know, different conditions. That's kind of how you, how you put conditions into your system. So we do the same thing. Uh, so we build these models. And like you said, sometimes models are useful until they're not, right? And we say, okay, uh, how can we break this model? Can we actually push the model to the point where we can break it? Uh, because we start putting conditions. We say, um, you know, if a cell, for example, we work a lot in cell death. Uh, cancer is a lot about killing cells. So uh, we say, uh, if I give the cell a drug, um, how does it die? And if I give the cell two drugs, then how does it die now? Uh, how, how did that change my conditions for death? If I now, for example, have one cell type versus another cell type, what are the constraints that those two different cell types put on understanding how the cell is going to die? So at the mathematical level, it's all kind of the same computation, the same statistics. We're trying to understand how an event happens given a set of conditions but we're using the language of biology to inform that mathematical description of the, of the cell. Um, that's, that's kind of how we approach it. Mm, I think the biggest challenge uh, now from the more conceptual side is that um, we are at a point in biology where models are starting to be useful. Uh, we can, there's some models that can predict many things, but some models that can't. Or there's some events that we can predict very well and some events that we cannot. And, um, and so we're kind of having to bridge this gap of, you know, how useful is a model, how useful is it not, or how not useful is it? My labs, and specifically, we're working in that problem right now. Even though you formulate a model, how predictable is it? How useful is it? How much can I really trust this model? Again, you know, uh, we're not at the point where you know you can launch a a, 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 a rocket into space and, uh, and and know what's going to happen. You know, with high likelihood, we are still kind of in the in the early stages of this. But we've had very good successes, not just us, but other people in our field. So you know, I, I'm optimistic. So Carlos, I have another question. So today at this unique point in time, we have a real issue of time to answer, right? Correct. How fast can you prove your model or whatever it is to get to a real answer? And mm -hmm. it seems like that is really important right now. Absolutely. So I think the, the main challenge, right? And I think at that challenge, um, we really need um, to work at that interface of models and experiments. And that's where, you know, people like me, people like my lab uh, work together. Um, I think that with computation, we can get to those answers quicker. And uh, having the resources makes us, make, makes us reduce our guest space from, you know, a, a blank canvas to, you know, something that is more specific. Um, for example, uh, we worked in a, in a very cool uh, project with, uh, from DARPA uh, two, a few years ago. With, uh, this was in collaboration with the lab of uh, Richard Caprilli here at Vanderbilt, where they would take mass spectrometry. They would just throw, they would measure everything possible in a cell using mass spectrometry, uh, RNA sequencing, um, 
some, some microscopy. They just would throw everything there. And then they would end up with a table of information with you know, millions of data points, and I really mean millions. And when we came to, when we came to this, to this, to this uh, project, um, they were putting all these things in, in Excel spreadsheets. And nothing against Excel, but when you have 50,000 rows and I don't know how many thousands of columns, and you have to buy a bigger computer to handle your spreadsheet, you know, that's where computation comes in handy. So what we did is we developed a new tool uh, that actually takes the data, uh, does network analysis on the data, it does enrichment analysis on the data, and it extracts a mechanism of action. It says, okay, this is the, we hypothesize that your drug or your perturbation is affecting the cell in this way. And now we can build a mechanism and give you ways that you can go and test it. And so this is the kind of knowledge that will accelerate uh, how we tackle things like COVID or how we tackle things like, like cancer, where um, understanding, uh, narrowing that space, even if we don't know the exact answer, narrowing that space to five possibilities versus a million uh, is a great improvement. And that's what I think we're bringing to the table. Fabulous. <laughs> I think it's fun. I, I have fun doing it, which is the most important part. It is, especially for motivation, right? It's like if you don't enjoy it, it's, it's really hard to, to, to tackle something so difficult. Uh, what, go ahead, yes. Oh, no, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that this is what I tell my students. Being a scientist is not worth it because unless you're having fun. Otherwise, you know, there's other, there's other crappy jobs that pay a lot better. So, <laughs> so. so th there's the humankind aspect too, Carlos. Um, imagine, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. How 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 enriching it is when a group finds a answer to a problem that affects everybody. Absolutely. There's the human part of uh, helping others, uh, feeling like you're making a difference, and then from a personal side, there's also the, the human part of, of watching your students grow and and watching them, you know. Kind of become their own their own independent scientists and uh, bringing something to the world and I think that that's really that can be very really, really satisfying well there's clearly been a, a, a long history of science and collaboration and sharing and publishing papers and I was while I was doing a little cyber stalking on you I noticed that uh, you came up as being contributing to what is it uh, pi SB systems biology modeling uh, yes, so yes. I so I think it's interesting, or I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on sort of the relationship between, you know, or how the open community comes together on a project like that, and you're able to, you know, collaborate with others around this tool set. Okay. So let me tell you a bit about PiSB. So I started that work when I was at Harvard uh, as a research fellow uh, before coming to Vanderbilt. And uh, I came back from a computational, you know, physics, numerical background. And so we were building models back then uh, about cellular processes. And so, uh, as I was saying, uh, with cells, it's a lot about scale. Uh, if you have low concentrations, you might have to use a stochastic description of the cell. Uh, if you have low concentrations of molecules in the cell. Uh, if you have high concentrations of molecules, you can use a deterministic model or a differential equation model. And the, the whole point here is that it's different types of mathematical methods. And the way that people used to do this is they would just write these things by hand, you know, differential equation one after the other, and they would and put those things into, into some tool, some mathematical tool, and then solve these things. And, uh, and so it was very tedious, you know, it's very error prone. And in the end, if you, if you look at a paper and there's a list of 400 equations, what are you gonna do with that? You, you can't just type those equations. I mean, yes, you could type them by hand, but it's gonna take forever. And then what do you do with that? So in my opinion, um, back then models were kind of a dead end. Mathematical models were a dead end. Once you got to a certain level of complexity, there was not much more you could do with this. And so this is when I was talking about multidisciplinary training helps. Uh, I was in a lab, in a mostly experimental lab. And when I would talk with my colleagues, they would say things like, when, you know, molecule A uh, activates molecule B, or molecule A and molecule B oligomerize to form, to form a complex. And, and those verbs, oligomerize, inhibits, uh, uh, activates, and, uh, you know, uh, all those things to be translocates, all those things to me are functions. And once I see a function, that means you can describe it uh, in, some, in some programmatic way. So uh, working with uh, people at Harvard, what we came up with was this idea, well, could we, instead of having to write these equations by hand, could we program, uh, could we make a program, write some code that describes those interactions uh, in, in the computer? And so we came up with PiSB, and the idea was, could we actually uh, write code or, 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 or write you know, reactions on Py, in Python and then have the computer translate that into 
the ma any mathematical form that we want, whether it's Boolean logic or stochastic or deterministic, whatever description I needed. So we have come a long way since we started with that. Um, PISB is a very different sh uh, approach. It's a, it's a, to me, it's a paradigm shift in that we, we don't think of models as a static object, but rather as a, as a growing uh, uh, entity. Uh, so for example, in programming in Python, uh, it's an object-oriented language. So I can go to the nitty gritty details of how those th that mathematics is generated, or I can just import a whole module of a set of reactions and not care about it and just look at things at the big picture. And that, that abstraction and that object management that, that the programming environment gives me is what lets us really kind of expand to, to do more things. The fact that I can take a program and say, okay, this, this module here talks to this module here in this way, and I can now big, build bigger models uh, in a dynamic way it's very, uh, it's very useful. So that's, that's one thing. It's, it's, a, it's a new way of thinking of, of models as programs in biology. And then the other thing is the, like you said, the, the crowd aspect, the, the community aspect. It is so satisfying and so nice when people email us and say, hey, I found a bug in your code. Uh, I was trying to do this and I think that this doesn't return the right answer. And I think the problem is that you missed a minus here or you missed a, or you have to, uh, you have, this should be squared and not cubed or something like that. And it's really fun to see to see that that back and forth, and then so that's been incredibly helpful because now instead of having my lab, which is you know on the order of ten people working on the code, now we have hundreds of people working on the code, right? And and everyone's working together. And then the third part is that um, we're also getting uh, feedback from other areas that find what may be useful. So, like I said earlier, um, at the core level, it's the same mathematics, but how do what what how you, what you used to describe this is it could be different areas. So for example, um, someone in their thesis in, in economics looking at, at micro versus macro economies or something made a PISB model for, for their work. And that's really cool to see how, how people share ideas and use the same tool for different goals. And uh, so I think open source is, is, is uh, I think, um, for at least for knowledge discovery is the way to go. Because I think innovation happens when you have a problem to solve. And so giving thing, people tools to solve problems is the best way to go, at least in my view. That's so interesting. And it makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, in just, you know, in preparation for this call, I was thinking about it. It's, I could imagine you go from this medical data about people as human beings, then you've got this, uh, um, you know, biomolecular kind of chemistry interaction, and then you've got the genetics. So, it, mm -hmm. uh, and how do you bring all those together? Well, with Python and, and, and mathematics, that's your... Yeah. And, and, that, and that was exactly the goal, you know, what, how many times, so I think one of the challenges in the field right now is, that, or that, had, that was happening when we, before we came up with PSV was that you would, you would write your program in, or you would write your, your analysis in some code, take that answer, plug it into another program, take that answer, plug it into another program, and your role is limited by, by, the, by, the, uh, by, the, uh, by the tool. But now that we're in the Python ecosystem, the last time I checked in the Python package index, there were 200,000 packages, 200,000 plus packages. And so now if I have data and my student, just yesterday my student said, hey, I want to use TensorFlow to, which is the, the Google, sorry, can I mention Google? Can I mention other things? I don't know. <laughs> I think they're a client. I'm pretty sure they're a client, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, but my, my student said, hey, I, I want to use deep learning to, to describe the dynamics of this other stuff. And I said, go for it. And now we have possibilities that we couldn't have before just because we're in a, in a programming environment versus you know, a static, you know, a proprietary environment or something like that. So that's, I think, one of the biggest advantages. And I think uh, the last plug, the, the, uh, Python has a very, sh a very quick, it, it's very quick to pick it up, even for a novice user. I've had people in my lab that come with no programming language, and within a week or two, they're already coding, and they're already doing things. So I really like that about Python versus you know, more complicated languages. And it's also the gateway to other more complicated languages. So that's why we chose that, that language. Carlos, this is Craig. I have a kind of a two-part question. I've always yes. been fascinated by how scientists like you find your niche. I mean, you've got a very specific thing you personally focus on. How do you decide mm -hmm. that? And how does it all come together so that scientists around the world have some sense that you, they're collectively working on the things that are of most value? And then the second part of the question is, how is it the technology you're using from IBM and others? Does that drive what you focus on? Or how much is it the other way? That, that what you focus on drives technology to, to catch up with you? So um, I'll, I'll answer the first one, and, and it's linked to the second one. Um, so I thought, when I was uh, when I was younger, I thought that 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 science was just like you came up with a problem and you just pursue this problem, and and that you know that sounds very um, uh, 
kind of um, poetic, right? Uh, in reality, for me at least, it has been, I think that all scientists like interesting problems. And um, interesting problems just fall on your lap. And you know, you're surrounded by interesting problems. And I think the difference is that um, scientists, or at least for me, um, I just kind of try to do something to solve those problems. When I, when I was an undergrad, I started biochemistry, and that's where I got interested in biology, right? Understanding how, to, how life happens. And then that took me to physical chemistry because I realized that in order to understand physics of, of molecules to, to describe cellular processes, and then that took me to systems biology because now molecules work as a system, and now I'm working on, you know, really kind of joining the scales. So if you had asked me when I was, uh, in retrospect, um, I really was always interested in, in the problem of scales, right? And the problem of how things transfer across scales. But if you asked me when I was an undergrad, I would have said I'm interested in I don't know, membrane proteins or, or something else. And, and it didn't, that maturity didn't happen until I was really uh, here at Vanderbilt, where I kind of focused on this is what I'm interested in. Now, in terms of tools, so I think, I think it's a chicken and egg question because um, on the one hand, the tools that you have available limit the kind of questions you can ask. So if you have better tools, you can ask better questions. But, but then sometimes you need to ask that specific question to innovate and to develop a new tool. So in our case, um, for example, um, the fact that we have bigger and faster computers allows us to ask more complex questions about how cells behave, right? But uh, without access to, you know, we're not the kind of lab that's gonna write, you know, again, just to, to use an example, TensorFlow or, or, or PyMC or one of this, you know, kind of numerical packages. Uh, we will use it and yes, sure, we'll tweak it, but we're not the kind of lab that's gonna sit down and write all this numerical stuff. So, so um, there, it's a symbiosis, right? It's a symbiosis where you have uh, the tools and the, if you give me a new hammer, I can, I can hammer different nails, I guess. Um, but also sometimes you will get to points where it's like, well, now we're gonna need a new solution. And that's where, that's, that's kind of that interface of work. Um, so I don't know which one comes first, but I have seen them both. So um, the fact that we have faster computers allows us to ask better questions. And the fact that we're making new predictions I'll, pushes my collaborators to, to make new experiments. So it, it goes both ways. I, I do have one more uh, question, uh, closing question. Uh, and you alluded to a, a little bit of your history, but I love to ask uh, science and, and engineering folks their kind of original tech origin story. So you mentioned you were an artist in the beginning, but what, what really set it off? For some people, it's the video game or that graphing calculator or the ham radio. Like what, so, um, what was the... I, I will tell you what set it up. I, I, used to, um, I used to play video games, but my dad would not let me play video games. So we, my dad had a home office and we had an IBM PS2, uh, a 286, a big deal back then. And there was a few games that I liked to play on my dad's computer. It had a VGA, I had a VGA screen, it was a huge deal. And, um, and so my dad would not let me play on the computer because you know, it was for work. Uh, so when he was gone, and he'll listen to this, but, and he'll, he'll know what I'm talking about. When he was gone, I would come and install the games and play. And then by the time he would come back, I would have to make sure everything was deleted and everything was removed, you know. And this was, a, this was um, we're talking hours, right? And so, um, once or twice, I entered the Dell tree from the root director and deleted everything. And then I had to, this was after, after hours, so I had to wait for my dad to go back to sleep and then restore everything overnight without, without even seeing from a backup. And so, uh, so it was kind of a, it was more of a, a pressure to learn how to do things very quickly without my dad finding out that led me to, to learn how to code, to learn how to make sure things worked. And then I had a friend, Mauricio Giraldo, who, uh, who helped me with this thing. So we, we kind of taught each other and helped each other out. And uh, yeah, but the, the motivation was the need to not get punished for using the computer. So <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That is an amazing uh, tech origin story. And you are, you're an OG, OG hacker there. That's uh, fantastic. Thank no, you. We were, we were doing basic back then. So, you know, uh, and we're, we're learning it ourselves from books, you know, because back then it was just books. No? <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Carlos. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day.